All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Claire Robinson, and I'm the Advocacy Director at Scholars at Risk. Um, before I make any introductions, I just want to note, as all of you just heard, that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, we have dozens of students in our student advocacy seminars who couldn't make this time slot. So this video will be posted on SAR's YouTube channel and made available um, to the classes to view this afterwards. Uh, so we will have time for questions today following opening remarks. Um, so all of you should see the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. And I would ask you to use that for your questions. Uh, we'll do our best to get to as many of them as we can, but we only have um, just shy of an hour. Uh, and so uh, if we can't get to your question, I will try and follow up with you directly afterwards. So now um, I'm delighted to welcome you to our final Student Advocacy Days webinar and our closing keynote. Um, as many of you know, Student Advocacy Days is SAR's annual event, bringing students and faculty together from across our seminar program uh, to further develop research leadership and advocacy skills. Uh, today, as you can see, we are honored to have Xu Wei Wang and Hua Ku here to share their reflections and experiences regarding advocacy in support of imprisoned scholars. Uh, Wang is a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and a PhD candidate at Princeton University, who as many of you will remember was arrested and falsely accused of espionage um, while he was in Iran conducting field work as part of his um, PhD. Uh, he was sentenced in 2017 and released in December 2019 as part of a prisoner swap. So this release came following extensive advocacy led by his wife, Hua, who coordinated and managed the campaigns um, in support of Wang. Uh, so Wang and Hua, I will hand it over to you to um, share opening remarks and uh, then we will uh, turn to the Q&A. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting us. Uh, it's um, our, uh, really our honor to be here and uh, speaking to uh, your students. Um, <clears throat> so I just uh, want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about um, how, uh, I was, how I went to Iran and, um, um, and got arrested and then the rest of uh, my experience in there. Uh, leading up to my uh, release. So I'm, uh, um, I was in my third year uh, when I went to Iran. Uh, that was uh, shortly after the, uh, the US government um, concluded the Iran nuclear deal uh, in 2015. So I went there, I went to Iran uh, 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 to, to study the Persian language. I already knew some Persian, uh, the purpose is to, to get better at it uh, so that I could do uh, uh, my uh, research uh, uh, in the uh, libraries and the archives. <clears throat> and then uh, um, the uh, paperwork and the communication with the Iranian uh, uh, interest section in Washington, DC, and then later on with the Iranian foreign ministry went really smooth. Um, I told them I have a language student visa, but there's no um, um, uh, research visa category. Uh, it, it, uh, can, I, uh, uh, can I do research on a language student visa? Um, and, then the, uh, and then Princeton University issued a, a letter of introduction and then the uh, intent of uh, uh, my research. Um, uh, and then the um, uh, Iranian uh, intersection uh, and later the Iranian foreign ministry uh, uh, acknowledged um, and uh, my uh, uh, research intention um, and then stamped my letter of introduction. And then later on, even issued a letter uh, to uh, with the uh, foreign ministry letterhead to support uh, uh, my research uh, effort uh, in Iran. Uh, so, uh, so I went there uh, twice in the beginning. Um, in the uh, uh, in the beginning uh, in 2000, uh, January two thousand sixteen, I focused on my work in the language school to get my colloquial language up to a standard and made academic connections. I returned home 
uh, for the Iranian New Year because Everwell was closed. And then I returned uh, to Iran uh, to start my ar archival work uh, in um, uh, May 2016. Everything went uh, really well. Uh, no one really created any trouble for me until uh, a couple of hours uh, before I was supposed to leave the country. Uh, then the, uh, I received a call from uh, 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 self-claimed Iranian police uh, for, for, for some question. Uh, and then they asked me to bring my computer and uh, uh, laptop, uh, the passport. Um, and then when I showed up, uh, they confiscated uh, my computer and uh, passport and then interrogated me for a couple of hours and told me you are not going home today. Uh, you will wait for uh, our further uh, communication. And then, uh, so I was kept in that situation without a passport um, for about 18 days uh, until, uh, and then they inter uh, interrogated me twice in, uh, 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 during this period. Uh, on August um, uh, 4th, uh, I uh, read a Wall Street Journal article uh, saying that the uh, uh, January 2016 prisoner exchange between Iran and the United States uh, actually um, uh, Iran received uh, 1.7 billion dollars of uh, uh, frozen asset uh, from the U.S. Um, and um, once I read that, I understood uh, they may want to take me uh, hostage for ransom. So, but before I could uh, communicate with um, uh, the Swiss embassy uh, the following Sunday, uh, uh, I was uh, called again uh, to a hotel uh, for questioning where they told me, uh, we have decided that you haven't done anything wrong and then we're going to release you. Um, and then I called my wife. I told my wife, the Iranians are giving my passport back and releasing me. Uh, they will take me to the airport. The Swiss will see me in the airport and uh, make a travel arrangement. But instead of taking me to the airport, they took me to the Evin prison. Um, and, the, uh, and where I was shown a um, arrest warrant uh, to arrest me under uh, espionage uh, charges. I was not allowed to uh, make a, a contact uh, with uh, my family uh, or with the Swiss embassy. Uh, and I was thrown into solitary confinement uh, for 18 days. Uh, during which um, I uh, underwent uh, daily intense interrogations. Uh, and then those, uh, but, but, but I still uh, remained hopeful because uh, nothing they asked me would really, uh, in my opinion, uh, incriminate me. Uh, uh, these are all biographic information uh, and also things about what I studied. And um, uh, 18 days later, um, they uh, made a movie uh, for me, uh, turned out to be uh, a propaganda movie that they will use um, to, to jack up uh, my ransom price later on. Uh, but um, uh, uh, but uh, so they left me alone after that for 10 days. Uh, and then when they restarted interrogation, they forced me into uh, confession for uh, being an American spy. Um, uh, with a one sentence only, uh, I'm a, a spy for the United States uh, in Persian and English. And they made it very clear that we needed uh, you uh, to, be a, to be a spy, quote unquote spy, so that we can have a case uh, uh, against you so that we can do a prisoner's exchange and uh, get our uh, uh, money back uh, from the US government. And then um, uh, the, uh, uh, this is this is uh, this is September 2016, and then in um, sub, uh, March and April 2017, uh, I went through some uh, court sessions where I was convicted uh, for espionage and given 10 years of sentence. Um, and then um, uh, in August 2016, uh, appeal court. Uh, confirmed uh, my sentence. As you can see that uh, these are all uh, Congru courts um, that um, did not al really allow uh, uh, 
any uh, the, 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 the Swiss embassy to be present uh, in my court sessions and my, my lawyers uh, were not allowed to uh, to defend me on, uh, until the end of court sessions or they are they allowed to make a conclusion remark. Um, and uh, no pre uh, no evidence or witness um, uh, were introduced or, pre uh, or, uh, or presented. Um, and then even the indictment uh, of the prosecutor were full of uh, lies, uh, things that I have never been asked or answered or talked about, uh, or uh, things that are completely uh, made up um, uh, were, 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 were read out loud uh, in the court of law against me. Uh, and then, um, uh, so, yeah, ab about a year after I was arrested, my sentence was confirmed. Uh, and with that, the Iranian uh, government made my case public. Um, and then immediately after that, the Iranian Foreign Minister Zarif uh, said that we're ready for prisoner swap. Uh, but this, this process of a prisoner swap uh, took uh, another almost two years uh, and a half. Um, uh, and then uh, from the time where, uh, from the time when uh, the Iranians uh, made my case uh, public, uh, my wife uh, um, took my case um, to uh, also to pub uh, also public and then started a public campaign um, uh, to uh, to uh, to advocate uh, for for my freedom. And before that, uh, it was uh, really difficult. Uh, my wife was uh, single-handedly uh, handling the situation. Uh, with the uh, university uh, and, uh, and then the US government and other interlocutors. And then now added uh, pressure uh, has forced him, uh, has forced her to, uh, to bring my case uh, to um, public attention for another two and a half years um, until eventually, um, uh, thanks to that uh, uh, intense advocacy, um, uh, I eventually was uh, released in the uh, uh, December 2019. Uh, and then during, during the course of uh, the uh, two and a half years, uh, what really made uh, uh, what really made me feel hopeful was uh, uh, knowing uh, for me uh, that uh, many people uh, in the free world are trying very hard uh, to advocate uh, uh, for my freedom. Um, uh, hundreds of uh, academics um, um, uh, signed, well, I think probably th thousands, not only hundreds. I think there were several letters uh, uh, signed by hundreds or thousands um, academics um, uh, to um, uh, uh, push the Iranian um, government uh, to release me. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, starting from, uh, uh, wasn't it uh, November, 2017, we had a first or October, 2017, we had a first uh, rally at Prince, September, sorry, September, 2017, we had a first rally at Princeton University campus where uh, 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 my wife and my colleagues uh, made my case, uh, um, uh, uh, explained the situation that I was in um, to a broader student community at Princeton. And that's the first time um, uh, we, 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 uh, we were able to communicate this uh, uh, kind of in a rally uh, like uh, 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 event, and then that was uh, very successful. That was picked up um, by national media, uh, Wall Street Journal, and among other uh, uh, major media outlets. And uh, and I knew all this uh, from uh, from a prison cell, uh, as I was allowed to call uh, my wife. And uh, I, I uh, so that was extremely uplifting, uh, because. Uh, one thing that I want to tell you is that one of the most devastating thing um, that I encountered uh, was uh, during the uh, very intense interrogation where my uh, interrogator told me, uh, you are forgotten, uh, uh, you, uh, nobody will remember you, uh, and uh, uh, the US government uh, would ignore you, your friends and your family will forget you, that, that you're rot here. Um, if you don't cooperate, if you don't confess, 
uh, you'll never be able to set your foot on the United States. Um, uh, and then knowing, you know, despite I know that's not uh, uh, that's not true, um, but but under a situation of in, uh, uh, unlawful imprisonment, uh, that's that's just a very scary thing looming behind. Uh, that even a one percent of chance that could could be true is devastating. Um, um, but um, knowing later on, knowing my, my 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 family and my colleagues and many students and scholars who don't know me uh, personally were rallying behind uh, me and my family uh, to help us um, and uh, to uh, to push for my freedom. Uh, that was extremely encouraging, and that meant a lot uh, uh, to uh, to me. Um, and then as time goes on, my wife. Um, uh, had more experience um, in running this kind of uh, rally and advocacy work, which um, uh, made even bigger splash uh, in the national and international media. Um, and then I think uh, these, these uh, public advocacy work are, are critical uh, to bring the kind of in, uh, the, 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 the attention uh, that uh, the, uh, at the national level uh, and international level to eventually uh, force um, the uh, relevant authorities in our country and in Iran to deal with this situation. So I cannot say, uh, I cannot uh, uh, underscore enough um, that the public advocacy um, uh, for, a scholar, uh, for scholars unjustly detained, um, uh, how important that is. Um, uh, in, in, in contrary, uh, to um, uh, uh, sometimes uh, the institutions or government uh, would tell the victim, uh, keep quiet, lay low, keep a low key, we're working behind the scene uh, to achieve uh, 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 the release of the person. Uh, we, can they, uh, we, we cannot say it never worked, um, but in the case of uh, Iran, it rarely worked. Um, and then, um, uh, I think we have enough evidence. Uh, what may really made the, the difference uh, is a high profile advocacy, unrelenting advocacy by my family and my supporters. And I thank them uh, eternally for the effort they have done. Well, thank you, Wang. This is incredibly insightful and also really heartening to hear um, you know, your endorsement as well of public advocacy in general. Um, we have a number of questions already, but Hua, I would love to hear if you can, a little bit about uh, the specific advocacy actions you took. Um, and if you can tell us a little bit about what you did, I don't know if you can, but if what you did in the year before the case was public um, and or even how things changed for you when things, when you were able to speak publicly about, the, about um, Wong's situation, that would be really helpful to hear. Well, of course. Um, so in the first year, the case was kept, basically kept a secret. So the perception that is widely shared um, among people like at the university and also in the State Department uh, in the first year was largely that Iran will release, um, this was, in a, this will be a mistake made by Iran. Um, it shouldn't happen. And Iran will release Wang Xiuye in a face saving way. Uh, uh, face saving way. So, um, and there was several, I mean, turns in the first year, um, you know, that was, um, so he was taken at the peak of the presidential uh, campaign in the United States in the summer of 2016. So um, in, the, in the second half of the year, or so everything basically was in limbo. Um, um, first, uh, the government will tell me that this is a mistake, this shouldn't happen, and Iran still kept other prisoners uh, that uh, we, on our side, we, be, we believe they were wrongfully detained, why they have to pick up another person. This does not make any sense. They tried to persuade me that um, he would be released um, if we give Iran the space and the respect and that they will release him um, at a certain point of the case, maybe. Um, so actually this um, perception occupied uh, me and occupied, um, as I was told by the State Department over the year, that every milestone of the case passed, it didn't happen. 
um, they basically rely on a couple of um, previous cases that happened on dual nationals that got somehow got resolved within months. So the time span that on my mind was within months that he would be released if he was prosecuted, he, if they got a case and they can let him go, if um, they put him on trial in court proceedings and they could let him go even after the first trial. And we believe that if we give Iran opportunity to to trial him a second time, maybe he could be released at a second time. So there's this like false hope that really, uh, really drive uh, me um, and to, to give um, enough respect to Iran. So we wrote like private letters that deliver, deliver to the Iran permanent mission at the UN. I never know who received these letters at a certain like um, festival, like national holiday of Iran to try to, we, we give you the respect. Uh, we, 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 we understand this must be a mistake, um, but could you please let him go? But it never worked. So it struck me really um, surprisingly that in the summer of 2017 that the Iran broke his case and immediately after within, within two days, they released a long list, uh, list of uh, Iranians detained by, by the United States of their name, their occupation, their background, ask, uh, and asking, like, explicitly asking for a prisoner exchange. That was the time between, I mean, rightly before uh, his second trial. So when the news broke, um, there was nobody actually came out, like, boldly to defend him. So that really made me feel very um, disappointing, I would say. Um, and he was like, Wang Xiu's name actually was connected with a wrong photo, which was not him like wearing American prison uniform showing on CBS News. And there were uh, media crew come to Princeton to interview people, um, but um, nobody actually reached out to me. So there definitely lack of voice there. Um, so I was started playing after I realized this has to be fixed. I, um, I'm sorry. It's okay. The number of times that has happened to me is embarrassing, yeah, so, um, but don't worry. <laughs> so I started starting in August. Um, I started uh, preparing for, for, a, for, for a visual uh, for Wang Xiu, really to tell the story who he is, why he went to Iran, the story to okay. give uh, the public um, that he's not a spy. He didn't do anything wrong that he should be released. So, so yeah. shifting the narrative, because before when it was a, yeah. when the case was not, you know, public, it sounds like you were writing private letters, trying to give respect to the Iranian government. And then when it became clear that that was not working and that his case was public in a way you then could take some control over the, the narrative, over the story and tell who he is and what he was doing from your perspective, instead of letting the Iranians or others, you know, uh, shape that for you. Um, and yeah. I mean, from what I recall, Hua, you did an amazing job of that. There were coverage in the New York Times and the multiple events at Princeton. Uh, I remember you going to DC multiple times. Um, you, you did so much. Um, so, yeah, this is really a long process. The New York Times um, story actually took a whole year yeah. to be published. We started um, reaching out to reporters in 2017 after the case broke and the case, uh, the story came out in the summer of 2018. And during this process, I would, um, I would say that um, um, eventually all the efforts came to, together to meet at a certain point, which lead to his release, which literally come from, I would say four areas. The first area is the grassroots campaign. Like uh, my friends and I, um, the daycare parents in my friends, uh, like the parents of my, um, my son's daycare and graduate students at Princeton and the students from Uni University of Washington and um, students, actually um, student activists from scholar at risk um, and also Iranian scholars, um, they at different point like join a campaign and write um, letters, open letters. Um, so the grassroots campaign is one part 
And the second part is media outreach because I, well, what really triggered uh, the media outreach actually two, I would say two causes. The first cause is the broke of his case. I reached out to Laura Secur from um, the, um, uh, independent investigative um, reporter. Um, she wrote about Iran a lot, but, um, and she came to Princeton to interview um, me, my friends, um, student activities, um, advocates um, about their understanding of the situation and put in a context of potentially prisoner exchange. So I think somehow that is helpful, although take a whole year to actually produce the story. And another trigger was um, in end of year 2000, uh, 2017, that Iran put, um, put up um, a documentary about one's case. That was um, some videos they shoot uh, before um, he was, um, I mean, at the end of his solitary confinement, that they produced this video about him and put in the narratives that he's an infiltrator of, of Iran, um, 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 as the identity of a scholar and putting the whole context of the scholarly exchanges infiltration um, into Iran. So when I saw this, that I, I didn't see it in the Western media. And when um, I was fitting to this uh, Iranian news, um, um, I sent it to um, the, the Today Show. And that really, um, I, I kick up the, at that time, actually, I was in Beijing. I did an interview in Beijing and I did an interview around the same contest with several media. And that became known, and that became known to the, to the Western media. What is, what is on Iranian's mind about this uh, liberal progressive like engagement with Iran and the scholar uh, community and the commercial community? What does it mean to the regime? The, the, the regime actually don't like it. And the whole narrative they, they frame around this, this is infiltration. This is exactly the espionage uh, activities they view as like criminal and they could give somebody's 10 year sentence. I think that is really a milestone to me that to really be able to tell a story using um, the narratives of Iranian and present what this is really about. Um, and along the year, of course, um, there are several um, reporters have been actively uh, following Iran news, especially following hostage uh, issues. Um, and right um, often, everything there's um, some some term, um, some something come up about a case. Um, they will write about it. So these people has been extremely helpful. And another and their um, organizations, NGOs, uh, NGOs like the Foley Foundation, um, and also Hostage US, they have been very vocal, uh, either behind the scene or like in front of public, to advocate uh, for the cause of um, hostage overseas and in, in Iran in particular. So another thing I think is very important is hostage alliance. So in my first year, basically, I was told that one US case is different from other cases, other existing cases, because he's not a dual national. They tend to tra treat dual nationals differently. And they're trying to separate this case from other cases. And it, I was told repeatedly that the other cases, non-dual national, uh, like dual nationals, they don't want to be, their case don't want to be discussed in the public domain because um, they have relatives in Iran but after, um, I would say, after a long time that um, these individual cases, the families realized this is not the right way to deal with this. So in 2018, in the week of the UN General Assembly, there was um, a hostage round table hosted by Thompson writers, invited a group of families for the first time, we met each other, we read each other in the news, intensively every day and um, over the last two years probably, but for this first time we meet each other in New York and we share of experience. It was not actually covered in the news, but that's really the first time that uh, Nazamin's case, like Wang Xiuye's case, Nizar Zaka's case, um, and the Canadian uh, Iranian's case, um, 
we, we all came together. Some families show up, they didn't um, disclose their who they are, but it is really helpful for people to to feel for each other, to vote, like to boldly support each other by participating, either um, speak up or just just listening. This is really really helpful. And we did another um, um, a press meeting in the in the following year in 2019, again in the in the week of UN General Assembly. And this time we tried to be very vocal about. Uh, why these do uh, these cases cannot be resolved is because lack of political will, uh, even in Britain, in Europe, or in the United States. So we try to we are really come together and express of, uh, ourselves, um, share our experience in front of media. So that was the second that actually right before there was a like um, a turning point in Wang Xue's release. Um, I think um, the last part, which is critical, is upper reach to the government. In Wang Xue's case, I reached out like tirelessly to the US government. In the first year, I didn't get exposed to any senior level, I mean, senior uh, officials in the State Department. My only channel was through the, through the Iran desk. Um, but there were so many um, uncertainties at the political front because of the presidential election, the change of office on this side, and also the presidential election in June 2017 in Iran. Um, that, of course, created a lot of false hope about things will come out differently, but it didn't. Um, so in at the end of year uh, 2017, I started reaching out to, to people. I think, um, again, what is helpful is, uh, is um, our, uh, were the former hostages, like the hikers, like uh, Jason Rosian, they share contacts with me. And in 2019, I was able to really establish some, some contacts that lead to some momentum of the case, although it didn't really achieve any breakthrough because we, we never know how these things will play out with a very uh, like fluid uh, political environment across different jurisdictions on this hostage issue in Iran. Um, I think another turning point, of course, was um, Trump's withdrew from the JCPOA that really created uh, a space for Iran hostage issue. I mean, I would say in the first time um, since Wang Xue's de uh, since Wang Xue's detention, um, and in the State Department's uh, priority policy priorities, uh, I mean, on Iran issue, um, there was. Uh, I think on the number seven, on the number eight, there was an ask um, for the release of all American hostage taken by Iran. And they're willing to use the world hostage. I think that is a big change. And they're willing to bring this book of work, I mean, um, under the special envoy's um, responsibilities. Because before 2018, um, although in the State Department, there is such um, a, a position which is called um, um, as you know, um, uh, Spiha, uh, Spiha yeah, yeah. Um, the, the special envoy on hostage affairs, which only look after um, the hostage kidnapping cases taken by terrorist group, uh, which nobody, uh, no like sovereign states would cl would uh, would claim they're responsible. Um, so these are uh, like random cases happening in, in Syria and other part of the world. Um, but for the first time in 2018, like uh, wrongfully, um, detained like imprisonment cases was brought to the book of work of um, the hostage, um, um, the special envoy on hostage affairs. So that was a big policies change because the special envoy would become uh, a, a vocal uh, point to connect um, uh, different agencies uh, in the US state government and become a advocate, um, um, an advocate for the cause of hostage affairs, which didn't happen um, be before 2018. So Robert O'Brien, I mean, during his um, years taking this role has been very, very vocal, very supportive to families. Um, and of course we repeatedly 
appeal to Iran. And what is very um, heartwarming was I actually, I, I don't have direct contact with Iranian scholars, but there was a group of Iranian scholars uh, where American scholars of Iran uh, background, they, they came up together to, to write a, um, a letter to, to advocate for Wang Xue's release. Actually, without, without my knowledge, this is really, really, really heartwarming to me. And also um, the Association of Middle East Studies, they have been like very supportive across years to repeatedly issue open letters um, about this, about this issue. I think <clears throat> another, another friend of this is uh, reaching out to um, the, the United Nations, um, the working group on arbitrary detention. Um, I know before um, people tend to not believe how these things would work, would be effective. But uh, according to my experience, that is very important to me to I think not only to bring this upfront in front of media again, um, because that is a neutral, independent voice. And in Wang Xue's case in particular, what is really valuable to us is Iran actually responded to our complaint letter uh, with, um, with narrative does not make any sense, basically repeated um, what they already posted in the documentary, which was released a year ago. But, that shows um, they actually don't have any evidence, any anything valid to claim that he's a spy. Um, so that individual, uh, like independent voice uh, from a multilateral organization, is really really important to make a case, um, not only in front of our government but also in front of Iranian government. That is extremely helpful. Another, another angle in his case uh, in particular is because my, my background in China. So we were able to, um, so I've been trying to raise a case to China, um, to China's uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and that somehow play a role to the eventual uh, moving the needle at least. Uh, we don't know what happened um, behind the scene, but I think, um, Whatever government, um, they can play a role in this case. Um, and actually, a lot of European company, uh, European countries, and our friends in European countries, and his uh, former uh, classmates in European countries, they also advocate write letters to European governments. Um, so this really come together in two thousand nineteen. Uh, when um, Foreign Minister Zarif came to the United States and he was confronted with questions about uh, Wang Xue's case in particular. And he just said to NPR News that he would like to do a prisoner exchange for Wang Xue's release. Um, and at that time, there are several I mean, Iranian cases ongoing um, in the United States. And there was one case that somehow work in a way that um, the Iranian release, um, um, the Iranian scientist, um, well, the United States release, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the United States released the Iranian scientists and um, at the same time, the Iran, um, Iranian government it released Monsieur at the same time and there was uh, a prisoner swap for his, for his release. Um, but um, as I said, if, Actually, eventually, after three years efforts, all of this campaign efforts, media uh, advocacy, and also this has been repeatedly raised to the top leadership in different countries, um, make these things a policy priority at that time, they're willing to resolve this. It really is, it's cumulative and it's, yes. and it's coming at it from every angle as well. And, a lot yeah. of overlap, I think, in, in terms of, of the efforts. So, I mean, it's fascinating to hear what you were able to organize. And I, I am you know, constantly impressed as I learn more. Uh, you, know, you had to start all of this on your own and uh, you were successful and incredibly so. So um, thank you for being such an inspiration, Hua.
Yeah, um, I would say there are so many NGOs like Scholar at Risk, like Hostage US, Folly Foundations, and also like um, scholarship like associations. They, um, they're so supportive to me and they brought up ideas to me, like when to do what. Some, some things is I improvise because something happened in his case, we're in the political environment, Iran, we're in the political environment in the United States, we're in Europe. But a lot of times, so every time that I kind of like losing hope because I didn't see any progress in the, in the case, but all of this help and support come together to make me to continue with the effort. So this is really phenomenal support that I receive over the years. Well, thank you for saying that. I know that that means a lot to us and also to our students and faculty who are also working on these cases for years often. Um, on that note, I, I actually wanted to address one of the questions in the Q&A here um, that I suspect has to do with Dr. Ahmad Reza Jalali. Um, it says, the scholar my group is researching is also in Evan prison. Uh, would you be able to describe the conditions of the prison or share any advice about how to get updates from inside the prison? Um, if this is with, with regards to Jalali's case, if, if you have any specific advice on that case, Wong, that would also be really welcome. Uh, well, uh, yes, so I was with uh, Dr. Jalali uh, for, uh, for, for, for some time, uh, for a couple of months. Uh, so um, we were in the section seven, uh, sorry, se section 12 of award seven. Uh, we shared in the same cell. Uh, and then back then his, uh, his, uh, his death sentence was kind of dormant. Um, but uh, unfortunately, since uh, I believe uh, two days before the Thanksgiving last year, uh, he, his death sentence was reactivated. Uh, and then he was uh, relocated to, I would suppose, uh, uh, a solitary uh, confinement uh, of uh, 209 where um, uh, we both spent time in. Uh, so um, in the in the general world in the Evin prison, uh, there uh, prisoners can make telephone calls. Um, a couple months before I was released, uh, the system of uh, telephone changed. Uh, so it became more difficult, but still, uh, uh, prisoners find a way to to make a calls even to the United States. Uh, so the only uh, only way to get a, a update is to uh, to contact or find find out uh, if uh, if we can contact the, the family of a prison uh, uh, prisoners. And uh, sometimes they uh, they contact uh, the uh, prisoners from inside the prison to the contact their family members. Uh, and that's that's a source of uh, I think probably the only source of uh, reliable uh, contact. And then occasionally, uh, foreign uh, uh, prisoners uh, uh, manage to call abroad, but that's very difficult. Uh, the general condition um, uh, is um, uh, how do how do I put it? There are multiple prisons inside of Evin, uh, so the general prison uh, is not too bad uh, when I was, uh, well, it was not too bad when I was there. There were some uh, basic uh, standards of hygiene, but lately I heard uh, from other prisoners that even um, uh, uh, patients of, of uh, uh, confirmed with uh, uh, COVID infection uh, were put into the cells of um, uh, other uh, 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 prisoners, uh, dual national, especially dual national uh, hostage. And I think that's very, very concerning. The situation uh, there is uh, very, very fluid. And I, uh, from time to time, I hear some updates uh, from, uh, uh, from, prisoner, uh, from prisoners' uh, families um, the, uh, reporting that the situation is uh, getting worse uh, because remember the country is under pressure, uh, and then uh, and then uh, uh, sometimes even when I was there, uh, sometimes the, the, our treatment is also um, uh, reflected uh, in uh, uh, by, by by ongoing politics. Uh, for example, when Trump left JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, I wasn't allowed uh, to have a consular visit for about half a year. Right, so these, these things uh, do uh, do matter. Uh, so uh, I uh, 
uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, because I have been out for a year, uh, the situation has uh, certainly have changed. I, I will not be able to give uh, the most uh, accurate uh, advice on that. No, this is still very helpful. It's good to hear directly from somebody who has experienced it, though. Of course, we wish you hadn't experienced it. I know time is short here. Um, I did want to share another question from a group that had done advocacy on your case. Wong. Um, this is from a professor at Mansfield University. Um, they worked on your campaign in spring 2019. Uh, he says, we were elated when we heard the news of your release um, and we're very curious about um, how often you two got to speak when Wong was in prison um, and, and Hua, whether you felt you got to convey much of the information about the campaign to Wong while he was in prison and and Wong, how did that make you feel? I'm so glad to meet um, Jonathan here. Um, so it was very helpful, like um, back in 2019, um, um, Jonathan's students at Mansfield um, has been so supportive is when, I mean, they prepare a, a very heart moving like um, booklet um, to showing their, to showing me their, their advocacy um, efforts uh, for Wong's year's release. So this is really um, lifting my spirits um, to know that um, young undergrad students out there, they're sharing this uh, humanitarian cause and like to do a lot uh, for Wang Xue. And that I feel very, very grateful. So when Han Wang Xue, um, in the first month when he was um, in solitary confinement, um, I was not able to contact him. And actually I didn't know him where he is until um, several weeks after that he was confirmed, he was detained. Um, so when he was in the political prison 209, which is um, um, at time together, it was like about a year, um, I was able to call, um, he, he was able to call me very briefly from five minutes to 10 minutes every week. Um, yeah, but it was, um, it's not, sometimes it's not every week um, because um, some religious holidays or some situations there in Evan. So maybe um, maybe the other week. Um, so but it, it caused me a lot of like anxiety, but in hear from him. When he was transferred um, to public prison, he was more freedom to, to access to, to phone calls. And he would wake up very early in the morning before everybody wake up um, to give me phone call. Yeah. That's very sweet. And I'm sure you had so much to cover as well. So it probably didn't always focus on the advocacy campaigns. I'm sure you wanted to know how your son was doing and you know what other efforts there were. Um, so um, it I would love to hear maybe as a closing note, um, Wong, you know, what you heard and um, you know, you had said that hearing of actions by others really helped get you through some of the more difficult days, especially interrogations. Um, if there's anything further you want to share there um, before we close, that would uh, be so, wonderful. Um, and I, uh, so yes, thank you very much. So I think that is uh, um, because, because if you uh, can try to imagine yourself in the shoes of uh, a prisoner, uh, unjustly detained, uh, um, because of, uh, uh, not because of what he has done, but because of uh, his nationality, his religious uh, uh, creed, uh, or uh, what he believes. Uh, and then, uh, and you know, and then uh, you're held uh, for, uh, you know, as a political pawn. And then the, 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 uh, the, the fact that uh, uh, something is going on outside, uh, that your name is mentioned, uh, in the national media, in the international media, where the, sometimes um, uh, even the U.S. government officials uh, were, uh, uh, were asked about our situation, and then they have to give a response. And then when when you know that the um, the Iranian foreign minister in a, a UNGA meeting, uh, a conference, was interviewed and cornered um, by the media uh, because of the advocacy. Uh, that made my case so prominent. Uh, and then you know that something is going towards the right direction, and it did. Uh, so in retrospect, I think that's a very most uh, uh, that's the most important lesson that I can I can I can I can share. And I also want to say uh, uh, very very importantly, 
uh, since 2000, I would say uh, 2018, uh, when when uh, uh, Hua and uh, uh, my other colleagues got more and more skilled uh, in uh, in terms of uh, how to run um, uh, uh, advocacy uh, uh, campaigns. Uh, I think with, with your help as well as, sh as she has mentioned uh, and also other uh, um, uh, organizations um, that it really changed uh, the way that I was treated uh, in the prison. So it became a bit easier uh, for me to uh, uh, receive uh, books um, and then to get consular visits. Um, and then I, I think these are um, uh, a very uh, important uh, for the person in that situation. And I think without, uh, without the uh, advocacy effort uh, to make my case kind of a priority uh, on, the, on, the, on the desk of uh, our, our national uh, leaders or other uh, international um, uh, leaders, um, th this wouldn't have happened. Uh, that, that is to say, uh, had there not been a, a, a good advocacy effort, uh, that I'm, I might still be inside of Evin, because I think I do think um, uh, I'm, I'm very very lucky uh, to have my wife and a, a group of a highly supportive uh, 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 friends and colleagues um, uh, to uh, who, who run a such a, a, a relentless uh, campaign for more than two years um, for me, but many most of other prisoners are not that lucky. Uh, and then they are still inside the prison. And then so, so this is one thing I'm also trying to to help uh, now as I'm uh, I'm out and learned uh, the, um, uh, the uh, from the experience of uh, Hua and others um, uh, uh, how effective uh, the advocacy uh, uh, was in my case. Um, and I'm trying to, uh, with your help uh, and the support uh, of your organization and many people in this call, uh, that. Um, uh, we can make a difference uh, to bring out uh, others uh, from Iranian prison and um, uh, prisons of other countries uh, for, for, uh, uh, for people. And, and just to note that there are uh, still, uh, Dr. Jalali is not the only person, um, uh, uh, not only scholar uh, inside of the Iranian um, prison. There is another uh, American, uh, Iranian American scholar, uh, Murad Tabas. Uh, who, uh, who is still under detention. And we're trying our best uh, to help all of them. Well, thank you for all you do now, Wong, and, and all, all you did, Hua, um, and for all that you both con continue to do. Um, I've learned so much from both of you throughout the years, and um, I'm really relieved and grateful that you're here with us today. Um, and I know that time is up and I know you have another engagement. So I will, I will let you both go, but please accept my thanks on behalf of Scholars at Risk and our student advocacy seminars. Um, we're all incredibly grateful for your time. Thank you uh, very much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. yeah, let's yeah. stay in touch. Yeah, please. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care.